for Lucy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, this past week, for, uh, first of all, if I say something that's not right, please correct me. First of all, I really didn't sleep well last night, but second of all, I'm all confused because you guys were a week behind my Tuesday class, but then I had to cancel my Tuesday class yesterday because of some, and I don't know what the heck's going on because I prepared for Tuesday and then, I, anyway, if I start talking about something and you have not read that yet, please say, yeah, that's not us, that's somebody else, okay? Is it agreed? Mm -hmm. And you will be gracious to me if I flub. Um, if I have it right, and my paper tells me I do, you guys read this past week Stories of Early Rome. Um, I found my maps. They were not lost. They were at home, embarrassingly. I, it was a shelf. It's you guys' shelf. And I, and I stick things in it in my library. And I rolled them up and I shoved them in the back because to make sure I wouldn't forget them. And then they went to the back. And then I kept wondering all week why my books wouldn't go in all the way. <laughs> they were there. Um, <laughs> it's January and we're all a little tired, aren't we? Um, last time when we left off, the Romans had thrown out their kings, right? The last king, just to jog your memory, he was terrible and his son was even worse. And after a shocking uh, attack on a nobleman's wife, who then killed herself in shame in front of all of them. Why are we having See, okay, I just have to say something. Last week I noticed all the gentlemen, just like when we're driving over people's bodies with chariots. Just, I told my husband what? this morning, now I've got the gentleman's attention. Um, you know, his Servius Tullius, where they threw him out, mm -hmm. um, his, his daughter and his son-in-law had engineered this and she <clears throat> added insult to injury by driving over him on her way home. Okay. Which is, uh, see, no, we're not Very no disrespectful body. Uh, so in 509, <laughs> and I believe if we did the math, it was 240 some years that they had had kings. Because we said it was about as long as we've been a country. That's how long they had kings. But they threw out the kings, and they decided that they were going to be um, ruled not by kings, but by an office called consul. Right? And they were going to have two of them. And they get elected every year. You can get reelected as consul. And so they started um, describing their years as the year of the consulship of. Joe and Fred, except their names weren't Joe and Fred. Yes. It, it sounds kind of like council. It does sound like council. And and I don't know if there's a relationship. I can't imagine that there's not, but sometimes words sound alike and they're not necessarily related. But they did elect them because they hoped that they would give good counsel to the country. So we can make up a connection, even if there isn't grammatically one. Um, they had other officials. They had a Senate still to advise them. Uh, but their consuls, it was kind of weird because whenever they were at war, which was a lot, <laughs> because you read, and you're going to read another week of all kinds of wars, uh, the consuls were their generals. Does that make sense? And so sometimes they would put one of them in charge of the troops in the field, and another one would stay in Rome and be in charge there. But, um, oh, I think I asked you this question. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, Sometimes they would have a dictator. So when I say dictator to you, what do you think? One yes. person in charge, really bad. Okay, one person in charge, really bad. You have something to, to add to that? No, I'm saying no. Well, one person in charge, really bad. Okay, do you guys? Oh, yeah, Lauren. They don't let the people vote for what they want. They okay, they just take over and don't let the people do what they want. All right, these are all ideas that we have um, of what a what a dictator is. Now, do you guys know the difference between, th this is set in the things people said about me, but it's an interesting thing to talk about. Denotation and connotation. Yay. What? Let's talk about it. Okay. Denotation, think about it. Denotation. 
in connotation. Think about it. I need it to get another marker because this one's too light. Okay, <clears throat> so so you know, so what's denotation mean? I, well, I, I get another marker. The word, but I don't know. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, I you've never heard of the word at all. That's like. Okay, so an easy way to remember a denotation is dictionary. What would you find out if you looked this word up in a dictionary? Okay, the definition. What does it mean? Connotation is ideas we attach to it. I'll give you an example. The word cheap. If I say this turtleneck was cheap, okay, what is the dictionary definition? What do I mean by that word? Literally, what do I mean? Not as much. It did not cost very much money. But when I call something cheap, what does it make you feel about it? Poor, poor, poor. Not yeah, good. it's not very good quality. That's not what it means. Do you see the difference? And so dictator, what, what Kyle said is have one person in charge. And then he said, very bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, one person in charge, dictator. Very bad, that's something we attach to it. Because dictators in the 20th century tended to be very bad. Hitler, Mussolini, you know, think World War II, think, okay, Stalin. <clears throat> yes, Stalin. So we have an idea of dictators as being evil, but the Romans didn't have that, that they weren't. It was, so, so you have to get over, every time you, in Roman history, you hear someone being made dictator, like we have to, we have to erase the connotation, okay, the idea that, that it's a bad thing, um, because for them it was not. What's a good thing about having one person in charge, Alex? He makes decisions very quickly. You don't have to. You don't have to confer with your fellow consul, do you? If we think if we had two presidents, <coughs> like co-presidents, mm. or even <laughs> back in the day, you guys might know this. Early in American history, they just like the person who got the top votes was the president, and the second votes was vice president. Yeah, they they didn't run together. So what if they hated each other? That's a bummer. And so what if the consuls hate each other? Sometimes when there's an emergency, it's good to have one person. And so that's what they did. Whenever there was an emergency, and if you're at war all the time, there's lots of emergencies. They called someone to be a dictator. Often it wasn't one of the consuls. They called someone because it would make the other consul feel bad. You see what I mean? What if you were the consul who didn't get to be dictator? Want me, want me, no, you'd feel you'd feel bad. So they they brought someone in from outside, someone with a good reputation, someone maybe who was a consul once upon a time, but they're not anymore. And we're going to read about somebody that that <coughs> that happened to this week. Um, before we get into the major stories that you guys read, these famous stories of early Rome, I thought Dorothy Mills made a really interesting statement, something that we could learn from. Uh, Rome understood, as no other nation of the ancient world understood, that true greatness in a nation or an individual is always bought at a price, and that price is sacrifice. Think about that. What, what do you have to do to become a really good musician? Practice. Practice a lot, which means you're practicing and not watching a television show or playing a video game. Sacrificing your time. Yes. You, if you want to be a great tennis player, where are you going to be most of the time? Tennis court. On a tennis court. You're not going to be in front of the TV or, or you know, examining Facebook or on your phone or whatever. You have to give something up. Also, in the case of the athlete, you're also going to be giving up certain foods that slow you down, that make you tired. You're going to have to give something up. You don't, you don't get something for nothing. If we want to be disciples of the Lord, we have to give things up, right? And not just bad, I mean, our own will. We have to give up what we want sometimes. Maybe I'm tired and I don't feel like it, but my neighbor needs me. And it's time for me to serve my neighbor. And I, I 
to give up that time that was going to be the me time and I was going to have cocoa and put my feet up. Nope, not now. Your neighbor needs you, right? Does that make sense? And so, but the Romans took it very far. They were all about attention to duty, all about discipline. Remember the Spartans? The, the super warrior Greek town, the, all the Romans kind of had that, that idea that we are disciplined and we do our duty, which brings us to the first thing that happened. Do you remember the guy, one of the guys who drove the kings out, Brutus? And that name's going to come back later, right? There's going to be a descendant of his named Brutus who's going to do a similar deed with different consequences. And uh, so the, the kings ran out of Rome, but they didn't just give up. I'm king, I don't just leave. I'm gonna get an army and try to come back and take over. And he was working with people on the inside. And two of the people he was working with were Brutus's sons. And the plot came out. And Brutus, here he is, he's consul. He's a leader of the, the movement to get rid of the kings, right? And his own sons are working against him, traitors from Rome. What do you do to traitors? Remember Tarpeia? Fling her off the rock, okay? They're executed. Brutus ordered the execution of his sons and sat there and watched while they were executed because that was his duty. That's the kind of people we're talking about here, you know? This is my duty, my duty is to run. My sons are traitors. It, <laughs> and you're whispering, so I know how it is. Okay, so, um, Tarquin goes to a nearby town, I'll show you here, in Clusium, and there's a king named Lars Porcena there, and uh, he convinces Lars Porcena that it's in Clusium's advantage to reinstate the kings in Rome. Like, I'll, I'll, we'll work together, we'll be allies, it'll be great, come on, help me, just let me in. So they come, and they're on the other side of the Tiber. And there's one bridge across the Tiber. And the first question I asked you guys is, for what great deed is Horatius Cocles famous? What did Horatius do? Yeah. He held um, the bridge against the entire Etruscan army, at least until the other Romans, who had fled in terror, <laughs> uh, could chop down the wooden bridge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are you guys fam familiar? There's a very long poem, I think it's got 70 stanzas, called Horatius at the Bridge. You know, at Memoria Press, um, there's sixth graders memorize it, well, they try, and the mm -hmm. ones that do it, they have a bronze medal, and so if anyone, if you memorize Horatius at the Bridge, I will buy you a bronze medal. <laughs> and you're all thinking, yeah, I'd rather have a Wheaties gift card. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. You'd rather have a bronze medal. Go for it. Tom, I should put that in the email, Thomas Babington Macaulay, Horatius at the Bridge, but if you Google Horatius at the Bridge, the poem will come up. Anyway, because this event has gone down in history. This is not an ancient poem, by the way. This is, mm, I don't know. Here, Mrs. Gamble's looking it up. I, I don't know, uh, uh, 1800s sometime. Um, anyway, yes, Horatius says, everybody get across the bridge, go in. I got this. And you may think, what? But do you remember the guys in the little pass of Thermopylae mm -hmm. when the Persians were, and if yeah. there's a little, if there's, if there's just one alley, they can only come through so many at a time. And you just keep taking them out. Well, two guys felt kind of bad. They're like, oh, we can't leave him out there alone. So they went out with him. But uh, eventually, Horatius told them to get back over because in the meantime, they're breaking down the bridge. The Romans are breaking the bridge. And you can't ford cross, just you know, walk across the Tiber there. And yeah, well, is, um, that, Ella, is that the bridge they made that you can get knocked down? Because didn't they make a bridge? Yeah. Uh, so in battle, like the eagle came down to the earth and get across. 
that, you know what, I don't remember that detail, but I'm not gonna, uh, that may be, that may be. Because it seems like a lot of work to break down a solid bridge. Um, at any rate, he's, he's fighting them off. They, he hears the bridge crashing. He turns, he prays to the gods, he dives into the Tiber, full armor, swims to the other side, arrows are flying all around him. And they say that the enemy was so impressed <laughs> he applauded because who cannot admire that sort of bravery? You know, even if you're on the enemy's side. Dave's wrong. So, hero number one, Horatius at the bridge. 70 stanzas. You can do it. You can do it. Oh, wow. Um, okay, but does this deter Tarquin? No, it does not. Because he knew yes, it was you did it. Good job. He did it. <laughs> Um, yeah, because he was not on my map. Great. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. Here's my little inset. Here's a square. It's just this area. Here's Rome. Here's Clusium. So next up is they come, and uh, they're, you know, camped over here across the Tiber. There's a bridge of time. And a guy named Mucius comes to the, to the leaders of Rome and says, I've got an idea. I'm going to go over there and assassinate Lars Porcena. This is going to go well. You know, assassinate. Great. Good, good luck with that. So he goes over. Unfortunately, he has never seen Lars Porcena, and there are no cameras, and he really doesn't know what he looks like. And when he gets there, there's two guys at a table, and one of them is the king, and one of them is the paymaster. Okay? He's, he's paying the troops. And he's got a 50 50 chance, because they're dressed kind of the same. Me, 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 my, me, <laughs> I gotta pick one of these guys. So he goes and he kills him, and it's the paymaster. <laughs> it's not the king. So they capture him. Love this story. And he kind of hints to Lars Porcena. Lars brings him in, questions him. Who are you? What, what, what are you doing in my camp? And what's the plan? And he says, Oh, you know, there's plans afoot. You're gonna have to watch your back. And he threatens him to, with torture if he doesn't reveal all the details of the plot. There's a spot, they're sitting around a fire. And he just sticks his hand in the fire and he says, this is how much Romans care for your threats. And he just burns his right hand. <laughs> <laughs> and again, the king's just like, well. <laughs> um, and, and, he says, you know what? If tell me, tell me. Um, no, go back. He says, bravery like that deserves a reward. I'm gonna let you go. I can't, I can't execute. I can't tort someone like this. And Musha says, what you couldn't get out of me with torture, I will tell you freely because you were merciful. There are 150 young men. Now I don't know if this is true or not. I don't know if he's making this up. But suddenly he says, there's 150 men, young men in Rome, who've sworn one at a time to come over in your camp to try to assassinate you. And as soon as one of them fails, another one's gonna come. And you are gonna be watching your back. So imagine if somebody told you that 150 people were gonna come one at a time to kill you. <laughs> he says, you know what, I'm done. I'm done, I'm, I'm out of here ends up making a truce with the Romans and not helping the Tarquins anymore. Mucius goes home, of course, to raves of admiration and applause, and he gets a nickname, Skyvola. He's Mucius Skyvola, the left-handed. Because, <laughs> you know, no right hand. Why'd you turn it all into the left And, uh, I'm going to he's left-handed. Wow, what's wrong with left-handed people? <laughs> <laughs> no. Wow. <laughs> I would, I would be helpless without my right. Yes. But um, he gets the nickname left-handed. And here's the cool thing about Roman, I, ca I say nicknames, but that's not good. He gets an, an extra name. He gets to give it to his descendants. Oh, like wow. all his descendants get to be Skybola. So people come up and say, yeah, your great grandpa is that awesome guy who did the thing with his hand. <laughs> because your name's Skybola, right? There's going to be, we're going to meet a guy, uh, Scipio. He's going to be a hero in the Second Punic War. 
and he gets the name Africanus, Scipio Africanus, because he conquers somebody in Africa. Nice. And uh, and all his descendants get to be Africanus. So you get to walk around like, I'm in that family. <laughs> Even if you didn't do anything worthwhile, you know, you can mooch off the good name of your family. Okay, well, I guess I botched my second question. How did Mucius get the nickname Scaevola? I guess we already covered that. Um, next cool guy. Well, this guy's not so cool. <laughs> Coriolanus. Coriolanus brings back memories of the Greeks because if you remember, he was a great war hero. And, but then it says, but Coriolanus, who was an arrogant, insolent young patrician, opposed measures to um, distribute for food distribution at, at cheap prices to the lower classes. And he made people angry so much they threw him out. Remember all those Greek guys that got thrown out by their cities? Well, yeah, except they wouldn't. Uh, no, not really, because ostracism, the people vote on, and this, the government just said, no, we're, we're, you're, you're out. And he went to their enemies, um, kind of like Alcibiades. Uh, so remember, this square is this little area right here. And very close to Rome is this, this town that has too many vowels, Vei, V-E-I-I. Bae. He goes to Bae and he gives them information about Rome and he, he joins the other side. And Bae is attacking Rome. He's attacking Rome himself. And I asked you what persuaded him not to attack Rome. All right, I'm going to let Alex have this one. Um, <laughs> when he was right outside of Rome uh, in his camp, uh, his mother and his sister came to visit him, and then they said, "Don't do this." Yeah, and I think his wife. I don't know if his wife and his children. His wife, but his mother too. His family. And his mother says, "Well, am I here as your mother or as your prisoner?" <laughs> He's ashamed. He's ashamed. He doesn't go back to Rome. But he doesn't attack because he remembered his duty, at least to his family, if not to his city. You know, in his eyes, the city has turned its back on him, you know. He's also got a duty to his family. And he doesn't do it. Um, Shakespeare wrote a play about this man, and it's called, uh, wait for it, Coriolanus. Um, Somebody will read that someday and you'll know something about that. Uh, the last guy I want to talk about is um, Cincinnatus. Cincinnatus was a retired consul living outside of Rome, plowing his land with his farm and his fields. All oh, cool. And once again, Rome is at war. Um, in the little, in the little, so remember, this is just this area of Italy. And I, these people that you read about, the Iquians, here's the Sabines, remember they stole their wives? And then um, the Volscians, the Latins, the Etruscans, they're fighting all of these people. And came to a crisis, and they needed a dictator. And they called on Cincinnati. Cincinnatus was, they said, plowing his fields. They came out, please, Rome needs you. Puts down his stuff, goes to Rome. When they make you dictator, you get to be dictator for six months. Wow. It's a six month term, and then if there's still a state of emergency, they can you know, re up for, uh, for another six months. So they gave him power for six months. He went, and I, it was some ridiculous short amount of time. Um, 72 hours, something like that. In a few days, he got troops, went out, took care of business, went back to Rome, went to the consul, and gave up his authority so he could go back to his father. He could have been dictator for six months, but he didn't want to. He did what he had been asked to do, and he went home. So 
Is there some reason for them to be in charge anymore? I make a big deal about Cincinnatus because there is a man in American history that was called the American Cincinnatus. George Washington. George Washington could have been president over and over and over again. Everyone loved him. He was a good man. Everyone loved him. But he, you know, a, a few terms, I don't even remember how many terms, a few terms and he, you he know, it's- for 12 years. Okay, so three terms. He said, it's time for someone else. And he lays it down and he goes back to his Virginia estate and his farm. And if I remember correctly, there's a statue, I don't know if it's in DC, might be in Cincinnati, which is by the way, named for Cincinnatus. There's a stat, there's a famous statue of George Washington and he's got a toga because he's dressed up like a Roman guy, which is kind of odd, because he's the American Cincinnati. He's the ideal of our founding fathers. This idea that you will serve your country for a while and then you will go back to private life and you won't be hungry for power. So sometimes you will hear in the news talk about putting term limits on people in Congress. You know, we have limits on president now. We didn't used to but we amended the Constitution, you can only be president twice and you're done. But that's not true of senators and representatives. You can be an American, you can always make your own. But the idea that our founding fathers had was this, this great Roman idea of coming, doing the job, and then going back to private life. And Cincinnatus was their ideal. Okay, okay. I, I hope I'm expecting one of you to come and help. I, I do not have this poem memorized, so yes, Alice. How, how long do you get to memorize it? Until uh, the end of the year. Uh, 11 Bad. weeks, 11 more weeks. I'll or if you come back next year. If you do it next year, I'll get you a bronze medal. Maybe I'll get you a bronze medal and a Wise gift card. Nice. Maybe we'll have cookies. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> I cookies promise is them better. a lot, because I don't think it's going to happen. Cookies and is somebody's going to do it, I'm going to have to fork it over. <laughs> <laughs> Some molasses cookies. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Big plate. Molasses. molasses cookies, that's your choice. I'm lactose intolerant. I can't eat grapes. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll memorize it. Don't worry, not for, not for the bronze medal, but for. I will even cater to food needs. <laughs> food needs. Oh, yeah, How long was it again? I don't know. I think it's seventy stanzas, but okay. Seventy. You're, you're, amount of scrolling. Yeah, you're, <laughs> She looked it up, so you look it up. I'm not going to print it out. I'm not printing it out. Um, there's actually Memorial Press sells a guide. It's just Horatius at the bridge, and it has all the like historical context and everything and so I, which I don't have but I'll find a way to memorize I wish it. I had Thank you. maybe if you just put it on tape and you play it as you sleep you'll <laughs> <laughs> put, put a copy or maybe put it under, under your, your pillow, pillow and it'll soak into your brain no, that doesn't work <laughs> by the way okay uh, at the end of your reading you met a guy named Camillus he's gonna come back in your reading for next week um, Camillus was another one of these guys who, uh, it says he was a good general, made dictator, uh, took a city by storm, but then there was a proposal that all the, the loot, all the war booty they had captured should be distributed to the people, and he didn't think it was a good idea. He didn't think handouts to everybody was a good idea, and like Coriolanus, people thought he was want to say Scrooge, you know, like he, 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 he wasn't generous to the people and they drove him out. And it, your reading ended with this comment. Um, he went silently to the gate of the city and there stopping and turning round, stretched out his hands to the capital and prayed to the gods that if without any fault of his own, but merely through the malice and violence of the people, he was driven into banishment, the Romans might quickly repent of it, and that all mankind might witness their need for the assistance and desire for the return of Camillus. Good grief. You're gonna be sorry. If this is no fault of mine, 
you're going to be sorry. So that takes you to next week's reading because hint, hint, they're going to be sorry. Uh-oh. Okay? And they're going to wish they had him back. So please, now last week, somebody emailed me and said they didn't get one. I felt like I was passing things back. Okay, so make sure that everybody gets one. Don't give. Don't keep them all for yourself. True? Okay. Uh-oh. All right, well, I do this, we have to remember. Okay, let me see if I, because I reviewed, but very, very awkward, no, very amazing, quiet elephants. No, 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 very play, awkward. Play, oh, awkward. awkward. Very awkward, quiet, very awkward, quiet elephants, quiet elephants play, elephants play crazy cro- chess. Crazy chess or crooked, cro- oh, Tuesday it was crooked croquet. The Viminal, the Avatar, <laughs> the Coral, the Escalade, okay. the Okay, the no, no, shh. I, I, I memorized it. With this. Please for the video. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So very awkward, quiet elephants play. What is it? Crazy, Crazy chess. chess. Okay. I got to remember crooked croquet on Tuesdays. The Viminal, the Aventine, the Quirinal, the Esquiline, the Palatine, the Celian, the Capitoline. One more time. The Viminal, the Aventine, the Quirinal, the Esquiline, the Palatine, the Celian, the Capitoline. Can you write that down? Yeah, you know what I will do? Um, I, mean, I will type up a copy of that poem I've been reading. Or would you rather just have the names of the... Do you have the book with you? I yeah, I do. But I already typed this. I'll, I'll, be, I'll provide you with them next week, all right? Because once a week is kind of hard. That's not fair. Um, you know what? There's no good poems for today. Uh, like sad. I said, uh, surely I can find something. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, DJ. What? All of them. Yes. Oh, that one's boring. I don't Isn't like death a good thing? <laughs> um, it's a good thing. It depends. <laughs> oh, how wow. about? I was joking. How about Roman roads? Ooh. We haven't really talked about this yet. Um, the Romans, <laughs> especially as as time went on during the Empire times. Um, but think about it. If you're going to conquer and conquer and conquer, so this past week. You read about them basically conquering the square. Next week, you're going to read about them spreading out till they got all Italy under their control. How are you going to get soldiers back and forth? What do you need? I guess I just told you the name of the poem. Roads. Roads, okay. (laughs) Poorly organized, wasn't it? Roads. You need good roads. Romans were great engineers. They didn't make... They didn't concentrate on making beautiful things like Athens, although some of their things are very beautiful in my opinion. But they they concentrated on making useful, functional, durable things, good bridges, good roads, aqueducts to bring water to Rome. So um, Roman roads are famous. In fact, I'm reading, I have two boys I'm doing a book discussion with, and I don't know if you know this, but C.S. Lewis wrote a space science fiction trilogy, and I'm I'm reading through them with these boys. And I was reading the third one this weekend, and um, it talks about an old Roman, one of them's following an old Roman road in Britain. Some of these roads are still functional 2,000 years later. That's amazing. Think about our roads. <laughs> like every winter they I fall apart, so and they're patching up, and there's potholes, and these things lasted for 2,000 years. So Roman roads Roads were, are dirt. Um, well, they, no, they, dug a trench, and then they filled with little gravel, and then larger gravel, and they put large paving stones on the top. So they were multi roads. Okay, I'll read the poem. The ancients used to say that all roads lead to Rome. The Romans needed many roads to bring their soldiers home. They marched away to conquer, they dealt in foreign trade, they traveled on vacation, they strutted on parade. To all their distant provinces, those roads ran long and straight. They made the Roman Empire glorious and great. Like you're like it's story time. <laughs> okay, here are your reading questions for next time. We're gonna finish. Did I already get them out? You already gave us. Our oh, I already questions. gave them out. <laughs> See, I told you. I. We're gonna blame everything on bad. I'll have to think of a new.
excuse me. Okay, so last week I made a comment, and you guys asked me about it, that there were apparently non-Israelite people who left with the Israelites from Egypt during the Exodus. And it is in Exodus 12.38. And the NIV version says, many other people went up with them as well. What tribe did they belong to? I don't know. You could, you, could, you could officially join the Israelites by being circumcised and following their, their law. But I don't know that you got assigned to a tribe. I don't know. That's a really good question. What happened to you if you wanted to permanently join up with the Israelites? I don't know. I don't think you could. If you were a woman, I suppose you would get into your husband's tribe. But if you were a man... No. Join the women's tribe. Would it be the? Would it be the? No. There's no women's tribe. No, there's no women's <laughs> tribe. Um, would it be like wherever you're born, whatever tribe you're born into, you're part of that tribe? Yes. So if you came from outside, you would. You would have been. Or what? What if a tribe fell? You mean dis like disappeared completely? Mm -hmm. Well, it all it didn't happen, but it almost happened to the tribe of Benjamin. Um, here, let me remind myself what section you guys read before I start talking about it. We read from David and Goliath up the, into the kings right past Ahab, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, Great Ahab, show. what a piece of work Ahab is. <laughs> um, yeah, so during the time, this would be for David, but you know, um, there was an ugly situation um, in one of the cities in Benjamin where a woman was brutally attacked and left for dead. And um, her traveling companion, it wasn't her husband basically, um, called out to all the rest of the tribes of Israel to avenge it. And they came and they attacked the tribe of Benjamin. And they darn near wiped it out. And in fact, the other tribes said they wouldn't, <clears throat> it's kind of like the Sabines and the Romans, that we're not gonna give our daughters as wives to you. And finally they had to negotiate they didn't steal them, but they had to negotiate to, <laughs> just, to, just to perpetuate the Benjamin. And the kind of creepy thing about this, it was an ugly, it was, it was an ugly, ugly story. And um, it must have been notorious. I mean, you don't forget that something really brutal happened and then a tribe was almost wiped out. And just in the next generation or so, it seems, according to the judges, um, Saul gets anointed king. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Just kind of one of those. Saul, I feel like, already had a strike. I mean, God chose him for a reason, and it was his free will. He, he screwed it up with disobedience and got the kingdom taken away from him and from his son. But, yeah. It, it died. Anyway, so it never <laughs> happened. I don't know what would have happened, but I, I'm assuming even that God would not allow that to happen. That was kind of a cop-out answer, maybe, but I, I feel like God was just not going to allow that to happen. Um, so, where are we with there? I mean, nowadays, there's probably millions of tribe people from those Benjamin. Probably. Um, so I don't know how well, I'm just going to make free with your table there. I don't know how well you can see, my maps of Israel are smaller. Um, so remind me, we keep talking about these tribes. Where did the tribes of Israel come from? Where do they originate? Brain fog. Um, Jacob. Jacob's son. Oh. Remember? Okay, that's why they have the names. The names of the tribes are the same as Jacob's son. So there's a tribe of uh, Dan and a tribe of Naphtali. But Joseph doesn't have a tribe. Joseph gets two tribes because his sons, he had two sons in Egypt, Ephraim and Manasseh, and they get tribes. So it's kind of weird because then that makes 13 because there were 12 sons. But we always talk about the 12 tribes of Israel because when they went into the land, they crossed the Jordan River, and the land got divvied up by tribes. This tribe gets this portion, this tribe gets this portion. But one tribe didn't get any land. 
the Levites, the tribe of Levi, his descendants. They didn't get any land to live in. Do you know why? Yeah, oh. They're not God. They're not God. They're the priests. They make their living from the offerings that people bring to God. They and their families are allowed to eat portions of it. And they have cities. You know, they have, they have homes to live in. But their job is to minister to God in the temple. And that's their livelihood. They don't they don't need a section of land to farm because they've got a job already. It sounds like a pretty dangerous occupation with how the how strict the gods are. Yes. Things. Yes, you don't do it wrong. Um, so but only the high the high priest is the one who's actually going in, but into the, the holy, the back room. <laughs> yeah. Say it like that, the holy of holies. The holy of holies. But yes, they're going in, they're ministering, they're replacing the bread on the table, the incense, lighting the lamps, filling them with oil, and yeah, they took turns. You might say, well, when if there's thousands of Levites, how are they all doing at once? They took turns because um, Zechariah and Elizabeth, remember when John the Baptist was going to be born? It says his his turn, it, I'm paraphrasing, but it says something to the effect that his turn came to serve. All right, so you had a it's my month to serve at the temple, so I go at the temple and then I and then I go home. But the Levites, so it's kind of confusing because if you count them all up, then there's 13, but there's 12 tribes of Israel, but the Levites don't get a, an allotment. And um, here, I keep going back and forth. Why don't I just bring my questions over here? Just as a reminder, um, David, so when David became king, he took Jerusalem and made it his capital. What other events have we read about in this book that happened there on, on the place where the temple got built? There's something important that happened on that on that mountain, on that hill. Don't come on. Or not Mariah, they talked about. Oh, wow. Was it Abraham took Isaac there to sacrifice him. Same place. I remember that name somewhere. Same place. Bring on. Place is important. You know, we kind of think like places aren't important, and I, I do, God, God is everywhere. God is omnipresent, but apparently places are important to God. So places have meaning. They're not just interchangeable, and for whatever reason. In 2000 BC, he sent Abraham to the place where a thousand years later Solomon was going to be building the temple. It was the designated place for the temple. Um, but so so David became king eventually. But there's an important thing in Israelite history, and it helps it make more sense if you realize this. When they divvied up the land in the southern part, basically it was the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. All right. Basically, that's who was living here. And the other tribes, there were a couple of tribes, you might remember, that asked to live on the other side of the Jordan. But um, Gad, something, and the half, half the tribe of Manasseh. It's not important. The other tribes lived in the north. So when David became king, the southern people, because he was from the tribe of Judah, accepted him, but the northern tribe some of them had a son of Saul, and they were putting him up as king. And there was actually kind of like civil war for a while, for seven years. And then David became king of the whole thing. And his son Solomon became king after him. But Solomon did something bad. Do you know, do you remember what Solomon did? I mean, he, God gave him wisdom you know, because he asked for wisdom and not riches and long life. Um, Egypt. Oh, Ethan. Um, didn't he like acquire like a lot of wives? He acquired a lot of wives, and what did that cost? They were too long and heathen, and so he worshipped idols. Yes. He built um, altars for his heathen wives, and sometimes would join them there. Seven hundred wives. 
and 300 concubines, which is like kind of, I always picture them as harem girls, I don't know, but basically a thousand wives. That's disgusting. That's a lot of wives. And remember, it's not because he fell in love with a thousand women, but a lot of these are diplomatic. You know, like if I marry your daughter, we'll be friendly with each other. Um, be that as it may. Um, I didn't know what to say. If they'd all been good Israelite, God-fearing women, like would I still go? Probably. But... Uh, the fact that they weren't, God said, you've disobeyed me. You're unfaithful. And I'm taking part of the kingdom out of your hands. But for the love of David, that you, you will retain the kingship over this, the southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin. But I won't do it in your lifetime. In the lifetime of your son, there's punishment. And indeed, Solomon had a son named Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, oh, I wouldn't say he's a jerk, but he's, he's young. Okay, he was raised in the palace. His dad's this wealthy king. I picture this young man who's always gotten anything he wanted. Picture that. And he becomes king, and the older men of the tribes come to him to, to make their agreement, you are our king. And they say, your dad was hard on us. Lots of taxes. I don't think it was mean beating them, but Solomon had tons of building projects, and he had this palace, and he had servants, and, and heavy taxes. Your dad was hard. Um, be easier on us. Go easier on us. So Rehoboam goes and talks to the old men who were the advisors of his, of his dad Solomon, and they say, you know what? If you listen to the people, they will love you forever. Okay, that's your opinion. Then he goes to his friends his peeps that he's grown up in the palace with. It's like, hey, what do you think I ought to do? I don't lay it on him. Tell him, tell him that your, da your dad's thigh is like your little finger. Like that, if you think that, or vice versa, I can't remember. I don't know if I'm telling it right. But you know what I mean? If you think this is bad, this is what you're gonna get. Like the comparison between. And he listens to his friends. And they say something to the effect of, what have we to do with you, O tribe of Judah? And they take off and they pull away. And from then on, the 10 tribes are called Israel and they're the Northern Kingdom and the Southern tribes are called Judah. So we have two countries. So in your reading, you notice, or if you've ever read, um, you know, first and second Kings, we have the King of Israel and the King of Judah. All right, and, and then you have to keep track. And some of them have the same name or very similar names, and it's very hard to keep track. Is there like a Jeroboam of the south and a Rehoboam of the north? Yeah, well, yeah, I think uh, Jeroboam was the north guy, oh. yeah. But some of them are even like Joash and Jehoash, and oh my goodness sake, it's completely, you need a scorecard to keep up with the players. <laughs> but Jeroboam, who, um, becomes king of the northern tribes, becomes king of Israel, he's got a problem. Here's Jerusalem. It's in the south. That's where we go to worship God. Jeroboam thinks, what if my people go down to Judah to worship God in the temple, and they just don't want to come back? What if they like it better? I'll lose my people. Hey, here's an idea. I'll build golden calves. No, bad idea. He built one in Dan, the northernmost city. I can't for the life of me remember the other one. Um, but he built a couple of golden calves, and he told the people they would worship there. Okay, this is the beginning of the downward slide of the nation of Israel. When my kids were little, and we read through this, we had a chart, and we'd write, like, the bad ones in one color and the good ones in another color. And we, as we read through, we had a kings of Judah, kings of Israel. Oh, the bad color. <laughs> Israel's just the bad color over and over and over again. They fell away very, very quickly. And God kept raising up prophets to tell them, you need to change. Because 
way back when, when Moses was telling them that God was giving them the plan, he said, but if you turn away from God, you will sin with problems, you will sin with depression, and finally, he will remove you from this land. You are partway into that. The uh, most notorious one that I want to talk about a little bit is Ahab. Ahab is sort of the epitome of the really bad thing for Israel. So, just to the north of Israel is Phoenicia, the country of Phoenicia. Do you know anything about Phoenicia? Like, does Phoenicia ring a bell? What do we know about the alphabet? Okay, we get our alphabet from yeah. the Phoenicians. Uh, they were amazing uh, wooden stone workers, and they made the purple dye. Purple dye. So um, you take these snails, and, and you have to dive for them, and then you mush them up and boil them, and apparently it just stinks like crazy. And you use it to, to dye cloth, purple, red or purple. And just pick a different color. Do we have to get the snails? Purple, it was a very expensive process because apparently it took a lot of snails. And they shipped this cloth, purple cloth all over the Mediterranean. It was the clothing of the kings. You know, Romans, if you were of a certain class, you got to have a purple stripe on your toga. You're, I you know, no, you're <laughs> rocking it. If you get a purple stripe, you are up there. Um, Persian king, purple, and they talk about his robes of purple or crimson, and it was Phoenicia that was making the money from all of this. Um, in um, Acts, we meet Lydia, a dealer. Isn't he called her a dealer in purple dye? Yeah, she's she's a Phoenician purple dye merchant <laughs> who listens to the Apostle Paul. So Phoenicia was a very wealthy country, but they had some seriously, deeply ugly gods that they worshipped. Now, I want to make it perfectly clear that all these, you don't worship anyone but the true God. All right, all others are out. It's not negotiable. But, with that said, think of the Greek gods that we've looked at. Okay. They're petty. They're whiny. They're, they're, they're not very moral. And, and they make their choices based on like what four-year-olds make their choices on. You know, what do I want? What do I, okay. But when something happens in Greek history, like um, Agamemnon sacrifices his daughter Iphigenia to get the ring, everybody's like, because they didn't do that sort of thing normally. Picture like elves and fairies in the woodland and dancing and I'm the god of the river and I'm the god of the tree and it's just, okay. That's one sort of false god and that's the source of the Greek gods. The Phoenicians and the Canaanites who had been driven out had another set. They had names like Baal. Ashtoreth and, and Moloch and they sacrificed children to them. They burned babies on the altar. And I, I hope you kind of get where I'm saying. I'm not saying, oh yay, let's go worship Zeus. I'm not saying that's okay. But I'm saying there's a difference in quality here. Like this is, <laughs> quality. This is well, like, like these guys are just sort of I don't know. They seem more like fairy tale ish. Yes. And then the They're, Phoenicians. And these are downright like... demonically evil. <laughs> oh, did you see? And this is who. It started with Solomon. He needed wood for the temple. And it so happened that in Phoenicia, they had large cedar forests. And he made a deal with the king of Tyre, which was one of the, the major um, Phoenician cities, to ship cedar wood down. And so there were these friendly relations. Okay, it's not evil to be on good terms with heathen nations, you know what I mean. It is evil to start following their ways and their gods. Um, 
But by the time it got to Ahab, Ahab married the daughter of, oh, I don't know if it was Tyre, but a, a priest of Baal. He married a Phoenician Baal princess. Okay, Alex, are you okay? <laughs> these people. These I know, people. these people. And her name was Jezebel. Oh, uh, 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 I know. <laughs> Which is notorious. You know, we call somebody a Jezebel, and you know, I, I like they're nasty. Don't don't mess with them. Oh, she was nasty. All right. So Ahab and Jezebel pulled these stunts like uh, the poor guy with the vineyard. If you oh, remember this, Naboth, who, and Ahab. In, in the Bible, it says Ahab was sulking. He was pouting in his room because he couldn't buy the vineyard. Because it came. Too bad. I know, too bad. And so Jezebel's like, yeah, we'll take care of that. And they set him up with false witnesses and have him executed and his body's thrown out. And um, the dogs are licking up his blood. Lovely detail that the Bible gives us. And, and yeah, the prophet comes that. and says, see that? That's where they're gonna lick up your blood. <laughs> Um, to make matters worse, uh, we've read this part of the line here. Worse. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, it could be worse. It, it is worse. Okay, worse. so Ahab and Jezebel. Here, I need more room. This just amazes me, but I have an editorial comment to make now. Okay, Ahab and Jezebel have a kid, and her name is Athaliah. And she marries the king of Judah. The southern king marries the daughter of the... <laughs> oh, and he even goes to visit, and he goes to battle with him. And he knows they're bad. Fast forward, but eventually, Athaliah becomes queen in Judah. She kills her own grandchildren <laughs> to become... Yeah. And then, and, and one is saved in the temple, a little boy named Joash, who's going to bring the kingdom of Judah out of the ashes because he's been raised by his aunt, who's married to one of the priests in the temple. Okay. They kept him hidden until he was seven years old, and then they brought him out, and they executed Athaliah, nice. and they wiped out the family of Ahab. Bye -bye. Oh my goodness. Cool. <laughs> that was a good decision. That is a great decision. For that. Yeah, that oh. We have four of that. <laughs> we have four of that. Yeah. Just put an X through there. Um, just so let me, let me, what are you reading for next week? Just a second. I gotta look in my table of contents. Just, yeah, okay. all depth and so, destruction. Oh, yeah, oh, here's my editorial comment before we go on. So, I look at this, you know, sometimes I read the Old Testament and I think, what a bunch of jerks. Do they not remember anything? Like they're coming into the promised land and oh, they're giant, we can't fight. Hello, you saw God wipe out Egypt. You saw the Red Sea incident and you think God can't take care of this? And then we have the, the kingdoms, oh yes, we will worship God and then you snap your fingers and they're turned around, they're marrying some priestess who sacrifices babies on altars. And I think, what a bunch of losers. And then I remember, though, so, now I'm not sacrificing babies on altars, but I remember, oh, how many times do I forget when something bad happens? How many times God has taken care of me in the past? I also can be quick to forget. Maybe not this bad. Maybe so. Maybe you know. Maybe God's bad badometer is not the same as mine. I'm sure that it is not. Bad up. <laughs> but I forget bad. too. We forget that God has taken care of us, and then we get scared all over again. We, you know, we forget. Oh. 
what, what it, it does to be separated from God when you sin, but then you don't turn around. And, anyway, that's my editorial comment. Maybe that's not true, as true of me. That I have to remind myself that I'm, I have to get up every day and remember that I obey God, right? Or, or, or that's where we end up, right? Yes, Ella. So, God is a lot different, or I don't know if this is true, but is God a lot different in the New Testament and the Old Testament? Because, like, I feel like when we go a little more forgiven, because as a pastor, does anybody want to, does anybody have a comment on that? Alex? Uh, the Bible says that God doesn't change. However, he made a new covenant with the world instead of even just with Israel. And also, it seems, um, he seems more forgiving um, after Jesus died because Jesus was, Jesus died on the cross for all of our sins. And before that, you had to um, sacrifice um, animals and stuff for um, goodness, um, for his forgiveness. And now all we do is just repent, repent, and we are saved in that sense. I'm, I'm going to br- bring up something, though. David committed an egregious set of sins. Not only did he commit adultery, but he had her husband murdered. Both of these are death penalty offenses under the Old Testament law. Isn't any offense a death penalty? Oh, uh, under the Old Testament. No, no, not not just any. Uh, because that's why they were bringing offerings oh, all the time. Oh. You know what I mean? Um, but did David get executed? No. Because David repented. God forgave him. Hezekiah, Hezekiah was one of the kings of Israel, and he was or at least king of Judah, and he was on his deathbed, and he prayed earnestly, and the prophet turned around, came back in the room, and said, "God's heard your prayer. He's going to save your life for two years." On the flip side, in the New Testament, we see Ananias and Sapphira, who it's not that they didn't bring all the money and give it to the apostles. It's that they lied. They lied to God, which you can't do. You can't and do it. But, but you, you, yeah, you can do it, but it won't be um, good. <laughs> they dropped down dead. So I guess why I'm bringing this up is we have, um, because the Israelites went into this land and they wiped out whole nations before them, we have this vision, and not just, a, I mean, this has been a struggle for the church for, for 2,000 years, more, more so since the Reformation, I think. I don't, I don't think the, the early church fathers didn't see it quite this way, but, but more so in the last 500 years, viewing a dichotomy here, that the Old Testament God is, is, is mean and stern, and the New Testament God is loving and forgiving. But there is going to be judgment in New Testament times, and there are beautiful instances of forgiveness and grace and mercy in the Old Testament. I don't think it's quite the stark, as stark as we think. And you have to remember, God was doing something special with Israel. He needed them to be separate. He was preparing a nation to stand Jesus. So it was very, very necessary that they wipe out those people before. And you know what? It wasn't just out of meanness. They, their evil had reached a height. So anyway, that's not, this is a mystery. I'm not pretending, I, I, I don't understand it completely, but I know what Alex said is true. God doesn't change, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So any illusion, it must be an illusion on our part. Oh, you seem mean and now you seem kinder. And having direct access to God through the Holy Spirit makes a difference. So Maybe. it's a point, point well taken. Maybe it's because we we have learned and saw God speak in person to know what He wants, and that will make God less strict because you know whether you do or don't. It seems like God was strict, but He really wasn't because He was extremely gracious to like even David. Like He didn't just 
flat out just wipe him. He was giving us a kingdom. He, he was preparing a kingdom for us. And his plan can't be done if you're sinning like crazy. That, that, that's a good point. You know, we, we sometimes think that, um, okay, I'm getting theological. This is just my opinion. This is what I've learned and what I believe to be true. Um, we, I'm trying to organize my thoughts. Here, Ellen, you talk while I organize my thoughts. Is this the Bible also say that God has disciplined those he loves? Yes, yes. So, so there is discipline. It's not, yay, yay, we live in this land of, I mean, it is mercy. It's all mercy and grace. But there is discipline. And remember when we talked about at the beginning of this hour that to be a certain thing requires sacrifice on your part? All right? It, we, to watch my words carefully. When we obey God, it isn't that we're checking off boxes on the I'm good list. It's that we're making ourselves available to him, all right? God's kingdom works in people who are living the Beatitudes, for example. Like, that's what God's kingdom looks like. And when I step outside of it, and God chastises me, disciplines me, it's because he wants me to move back into it because I can't be Ruth. I'm not my best self outside of it, right? He wants me to be what he created me to be. And when I step outside and I disobey, I can't be that. It's like you know, your dog poos on the carpet and you're trying to train it, you know, and you discipline the dog, or in, from the dog's perspective, maybe, you know, the master seems a little harsh, but the master knows he's fitting you to live in the house and sit by the fire and get petted and get dog, you know, and be a member of the family. And when the dog does that, he's not suited to be that anymore. I don't know if I'm explaining it very well, but. That makes sense. Anyway, yeah. 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 It's just it's just exactly like a shepherd. Yes. Yes. He wants me to be what he he designed me to be, and I need to cooperate. And the, my cooperation is obedience. So, and that was true in the Old Testament and the New Testament. David was disobedient, but realized his disobedience and always came back. Solomon, it sounds like, was disobedient, and he just didn't ever. Repent, you know, like God finally had to lay down and say, you know what? You are outside this of, of this place I've set for you, of this place of obedience. And there's gonna be consequences. Okay. Still trying to make Oh my gosh, is that how does this always sometimes I think, oh an hour and a half, that's a long time. No, it's not. It's never. Okay. I have your um, Shepherd Boy and the Wolf papers, which I am greatly looking forward to reading. I have enjoyed <laughs> tremendously the creativity. I'm so glad that we took a step back from doing these essays because it gave me a chance to get to know you all a little better. And um, again, it's interesting that the gentlemen's papers often involve gruesome details. I've never had one of those personal. Oh, I know. Yeah, 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 and, and there are gruesome ladies. But on the whole, there's a gender dichotomy of what happens to these poor creatures. <laughs> um, so we are going to take another step to the side. Um, there's several different kinds of writing that we all need to be able to take care of. Um, one is arguing a point, right? So that long paper that was very difficult to do, the oral or psyche paper. Um, I'd like to do at least one more of those. I was telling Alex, you know, this is week 19. We only have 11 more weeks together. She's like, oh, 11 weeks. That doesn't sound very long to me when I'm thinking of assignments, you know. Um, but I'm, we're not reading anything that lends us very well to an essay right now. But I'm going to work with that. We're, we're going to do at least one more persuasive essay, arguing point. Um, the other thing that it's good for people to do is um, fiction writing, which you've been working on, which I, again, have been very impressed with. Really enjoyed the detail. I told you guys to be detailed, 
and oh my goodness, I got lovely detail and it really made it come alive. So the third kind of writing that you will need to do in a college setting, in high school, is it, it's called expository writing. That's a fancy name for research, okay? So you're not arguing a point. You're not trying to persuade me that something is true or false. You are collecting information and presenting it, okay? Now, how many, remind me of this, how many of you have done the Institute for Excellence in Writing? Okay, and have you done units four and six? The ones, okay, okay. writing from a, one resource or writing from multiple sources? Okay, did you do the multiple sources one? Okay, okay. So for those of you who have done this before, we're gonna spend a few weeks on this while we finish up Josephus, okay? Because I think it's good to touch on this type of writing as well. And if you've done the IW, you kind of know how to do this, although it's always good to be reminded and reviewed. If you haven't, then maybe you haven't done this before. But for example, say you were asked to write a report on turtles. Your mom says, well, you found a turtle in your yard, and your mom, being a good homeschooling mother, says this is a teachable moment. We're writing a paper on turtles. No. <laughs> no. I think you know. And so you're like, okay, where do I start? So I go, okay, this shows my age. I go to the encyclopedia, like anybody knows that anymore. Um, back in the day, I went to the encyclopedia, and I looked up turtles. It's like, turtles are, what are they? They're amphibians or reptiles? <laughs> I don't think it's going to say that in the encyclopedia. <laughs> yeah. What are turtles? Are turtles amphibians? They're reptiles. They're reptiles. They're reptiles. But they can, they, mm -hmm. they stick in the mud. And they swim. And they lay their eggs. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're, they're bizarre. They need their own they, food. Well, they're like the Yeah, okay. All right, whatever. Turtles are, what did you tell me? They're reptiles. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much I know and care about turtles. Um, and, uh, blah, 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 there's different kinds of turtles, and the great Galapagos turtle, and blah, blah. And it's, it's an article, and it's a full page with two columns and another page, and you're like, okay, that's way too, I don't know. So you just start writing it down, and you're just copying it, and then you realize, oh, I think I learned once that you can't just copy down what books say. That's called plagiarism. You can't just rewrite what someone else said and pretend it's yours, no. No, wrong, very wrong. So I was, oh no, what do I do? We're gonna get together, we're gonna write a re, uh, one paragraph in one week. It's gonna be very easy. A one paragraph report on Roman religion. All right, and I've got your source. We're gonna do from one source. So it's gonna be very Yes. <laughs> it's like the encyclopedia page. No, you're not. <laughs> All right. So, okay, I should be able to keep one of these. Be, uh, was there an extra? Oh, did you, um, Sophie, did you keep it for Lucy? The, an extra question? No. Okay, great. Um, I'm going to use, don't leave without the spare one, but I'm going to keep it so I can read from it, okay? And then I'll give it to you for free. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. I want you to get a piece of paper out. Oh, this is easy. I'll just, I'll just do a keyword outline. Yes, we're doing a keyword outline. Yes. Sir, can I can I be can I be a human, please? Thank you. Thank you. We have very limited time. Ooh. <laughs> yes. What? Oh. Okay. Does anybody? Is there an extra one? Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I didn't print one out for you, but I can send you one because you're not doing the Rome. Okay. But if you want one, I, I would like one. Okay. Um, give give her your. Hey, um, Sophie, do you think you and Lucy could share? Okay. Yes, you go. Okay, so here's what you guys share now. Then I will give you one. And then I will, or, or I'll get the extra person. Okay, we got it. You mean clincher as in like the, um, basically the end where it shows like, you yeah. know, like the. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do this like you've never heard it before. 
Okay. And some of you have never heard it before, okay? And if you have, don't blank out on me, don't take a nap, because we haven't done it in a while, and this is good. Remember, this is how we approach, if we have to write a report on something, right? So we're not arguing a, um, a point. Should someone have done something? Is this right or wrong? Should we use paper or plastic? Should, <laughs> 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 I just spoke in my head. Okay. This is just giving information, okay? I'm not trying to, to prove to you that Roman religion is good or Roman religion is bad. I'm just telling you about it, okay? So, our first sentence is called the topic sentence. We've talked about this before with our other, with our other things we've written. The first sentence of your paragraph tells me what is this paragraph about? I want all of you to write here, Roman religion. That is what your paragraph is about. And actually, guys, we're going to do the keyword outline together, and you're going to use this outline. Oh, yeah. We're doing the work for you now. Yes? I'm just wondering why Alex doesn't have a piece of paper out. And oh, I'm yes. Do you need a paper? Yeah, Alex. Thank you. I didn't notice. You need to have a piece of paper out. Yeah. <laughs> Especially since he here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you write in the front. <laughs> you could write it on the back. But, but then you have to keep. So I did. <laughs> I need, like, teaching assistance. Well, so Just like that, too. <laughs> well, she's, she's watching this up, so. so she yes. Would if it, all your parents were here. Okay. So, now, here's the rule. Um, I, I would like to get at least seven. The rule is generally four to seven. I feel like we can find seven off this much information. Mm -hmm. Okay? Definitely. Here's the rule. I'm going to write it down if I think, you don't have to write this down, if it is interesting or important. Now, <laughs> You get to decide if it's interesting or important. All right, you have freedom here. So now we're going to do this together because some of you have never done this before. I'm going to give you another one next week, and you're going to do the outline. Okay, at home, and you get to pick what's interesting and important. Today, I get to pick what's interesting and important. Sorry. Now, since we're just writing one paragraph, we're just calling the whole thing Roman religion. I'm sure you could imagine that if I were writing a long paper, I could divide Roman religion into Roman gods. There could be a whole paragraph on that. Roman temples. There could be a whole paragraph on that. Uh, uh, I've got headings. Growth of religion. Worship at home. The state religion. Temples and ceremonies. It's given me headings right here on this paper. But I'm not going to do that because I'm only writing one paragraph. I'm lumping it all in. If it has anything to do with Roman religion, it's fair game. Okay. And then I take my source, whatever it is. This is my source. Could be a book. Um, I am going to start preaching now and say that use real books and not the internet when you do research. This is from an American book. It's from a book. I wouldn't give you an internet thing and then tell you not to use the internet. <laughs> I'm a little it has a page crazy, number. but not that crazy. Yes, it has a page number. Here's why. You have no idea who put that thing on the internet. Mm -hmm. There are trusted websites you can go to. But for the most part, if I read it on the internet, I read it skeptically. Because it could just be some joker in his mom's basement posting <laughs> stuff. I don't know. Right? I don't know that it's true. When it's published, it goes through a process of fact-checking, or the publisher will get in trouble. Right? They will get called out for publishing false information. So, th that is that is my feeling about that topic. Yes? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not just because I'm old and I don't like the internet. 
it's, it's really because the internet and not can, only can be a dangerous place, but you just don't know what's true. And people, don't be gullible like some of your peers. Don't be gullible like some of my peers, frankly, who see it online and believe it's true, whether it's about turtles. I mean, I, it says turtles are birds. It says it on the internet. No, <laughs> but it says it. No, it's not true. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to begin reading through my source, and I'm going to decide if something is interesting or important. Now, I'm not going to write out the whole sentence. Remember plagiarism? Uh -oh. You're not allowed to just copy whole things, but you IEW people will remember this. I'm going to try to pick three words out of the sentence or the thought and just jot them down just to jog my memory. All right? There's nothing more. This is just to try to remember what it was I wanted to remember because my brain will not remember unless I write it down. Here we go. The Romans had many different gods and goddesses. Okay. They fell into two main groups, spirits that were thought to protect houses and were worshipped domestically, and the gods who were goddesses, and, I'm sorry, and the gods and goddesses of the formal state religion who were worshipped at public ceremonies. Worship of household spirits was the earliest form of Roman religion. The rituals of organized state religion, see below, became more elaborate during the expansion of the empire. Okay, I'm not gonna write any of that down because it looks to me like they're gonna tell me more about it down below. I'm gonna kind of wait and see what they're gonna tell me before I make any decisions. Worship at home. Romans believed that their homes were controlled by spirits of numina, household spirits. One group, the penates, protected the stores, not the stores like where you go shopping, but the pantry. Another, the lares, looked after the whole household. Ooh, I know, I think this is interesting. I'm kind of interested in this. Um, okay, they had household gods. Um, No, we don't have to use the same ones as you. You use well, other ones. Yeah, um, if you've never done this before, I really think you should choose the same ones as me. Okay. Um, I, I, I guess if you feel comfortable with it, it's okay. It's a bit different. Um, I'm trying to decide if I want to put the lares and penates on there. Um, oh, since it's such a short paragraph, I'm not going to include. Well, you know what? I'm going to break my um, lares. Penates. You don't have to be strict with this rule. You just you can't write yes. it down the whole entire thing. Yes. Okay. So the Roman rule they had household gods, which they called Lars and Penates. Each family had its own guardian spirit, the genius, an ancestral spirit. Ooh, I like guardian. I like guardian spirit of a household. A guardian spirit. The genius. You could also make household, like put a house and then plus hold. I could, I could. I like to not go too crazy with my pictures with this, because <laughs> if you're gonna take that much time to draw the picture, or if you go back later and you're like, I don't know what this picture of. These beliefs began early among early farmers, but were retained in the sophisticated urban houses, blah, blah, blah. Some Numina took on individual personality. Okay, don't care about the rest of that. I've only got seven <laughs> points to do here. See, this is a really easy thing because after I get my seven interesting or important things, I'm done. This is why if you don't like writing reports, this is an awesome way to do it. Okay, growth of religion. Frankly, that sounds a little boring, but I'm gonna check it out. As the Romans conquered areas outside Rome itself, they met people who worshiped other gods and goddesses. Rather than suppressing these other religions, they often adopted them. As the empire expanded, the number of deities grew. Oh, I actually do think that's interesting. The Romans um, absorbed the gods, or no, not absorbed, adopted. Adopted the gods of, I'm just gonna play fast and loose with my three, of neighboring tribes. 
It's kind of interesting to me because we talked about the fact that they keep absorbing other tribes and making them Roman. And when they do that, they also pick up their gods. And you know what? They're going to keep doing it in the empire. They're just going to keep going all around the Mediterranean and picking this up gods. This is and it's uh, past 05. Okay, okay. We're, we're same religion. The Romans were attracted to Greek mythology. They matched their Roman gods, see Overleaf, which I didn't print out for you, um, with the Greek ones, making them the basis of their state. Ooh, ooh. Um, based um, Greek gods led to their state religion. That seems important. Maybe it's not interesting, but it certainly seems important. Romans could worship any number of gods and did this by praying and making sacrifices. Most people believed they were protected by a particular god or goddess. They also believed that each deity looked after a particular aspect of life. For example, people prayed to Venus for love or Mars for war. Hmm. Um, worshipped... No, I... Each person, no, how do I say this? What I want to say is that each person could worship lots of gods. Um, like they might have freedom. Okay, freedom, worship many gods. Um, wait a minute, where are we at? Well, I, I just read the part that um, Romans could worship any number of gods and did this by praying and making sacrifices. Uh, like the idea, somehow the idea that it wasn't like my family worships this god or your family maybe, worships that god. We just, it's all control. Maybe make people, but P P L. Okay. Um, and then people worship. Worship, yeah, worship. Many or all. We can make all, all gods. All, gods. all, all, all gods. gods. Okay. Because you don't want to leave one out accidentally because they might. Yeah. I don't believe that, but that's what they believe. Okay. Temples and ceremonies. The state deities had large and impressive temples. Okay. Uh, built large temples. Now I'm more concerned with time than I am with interesting and important. <laughs> Their layout was adopted from those of the Etruscans and Greeks. Temples contained treasure, one in battle. Ooh, ooh. Um, I like that. We're going to put an put a arrow from temples. Ooh. Contained... Battle treasure. Ooh, who doesn't love battle treasure? Nice. All right. So, nice. I've got my seven interesting or important things. Then when I go home, I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to turn this into a paragraph. Yes, Ella? Sorry, what's a deity? Uh, a god. Oh. Deus means god in Latin. Mm -hmm. Deity means a god. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> I always manage to work Latin and English one time. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do. Uh, this is you, but now I'm you, okay? I'm any one of you. Not, I've flipped it to Hannah, but I'm not <laughs> any one of you. I'm sitting down. Okay, here, I've got this in front of me. Okay, Roman religion. I have to turn that into a sentence. Roman religion is very interesting. <laughs> that's a very boring sentence. But it's a complete sentence, and it tells you what it's about. You can make a dramatic opening. I could make a dramatic opening. I hope your sentence will be better than mine. But somehow your first sentence needs to tell me that this paragraph is about Roman religion. Except don't write, this paragraph is about Roman religion. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, now I look at this. Oh, uh, Romans, each Roman household had its own gods, which they called the Lares and Penates. Boom, done. Um, the guardian spirit of the household was called its genius. Done. Romans, as they conquered neighboring tribes, adopted their gods and made them their own. Done. done. They used the Greek gods in particular as the basis of the state religion. Done. Done. Uh, the Roman people were free to worship all the gods that they wished. Done. They built for them large and majestic temples. I just drew that in because that would inspire. 
Inside the temple, they would bring the treasure collected from their many successful battles with neighboring tribes. Okay, so now, here's the thing. If I just stop there, my paragraph just, my, my poor reader just stops. It's just so abrupt, treasure. So what I'm gonna do is write a final sentence that repeats what this paragraph is about. As you can see, no, no, I, I'm changing that. As this well. only scratches the surface of the depth of amazing Roman religion, okay? And now I've reminded you at the end, this is what we're writing about. That's what you're gonna do this week. You're gonna sit down with this and you're gonna turn them back into sentences. And when you're done, you're going to have a paragraph about Roman religion. Does that make sense to yes. everybody? Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to do the dress ups and okay. If you want I'm to, totally you, gonna do you those. Do it. Go for it. But that's what I want you to do. And then next week we're gonna give one, but I'm gonna let you do it. Maybe we'll do it communally, but I'm, I don't know. I'll, I'll think about it. We'll see how it goes. All right. Are we good? Oh, and in the Josephus book, please read. Uh -oh. Sorry, chapters 66 through 94. Oh, it's, I divided it up by page numbers. I'm joking. I promise. 66, 66 through 94. Okay. Which will take you up through to Alexander the Great. Ooh. And then after that, you'll be reading some material that's not in the Old Testament. You'll be hearing about the Greek, the Hellenistic rulers of that area after Alexander died. Paper. Who needs, who's currently missing the paper? Is it? <gasps> Good throw. Nice. Yeah. Nice. No, no, it's better than. Lana, what's this supposed to be? It's better okay. than. Oh, I need to turn my computer off. Hold on.